Welcome to Parker's MMA Show. If you want to learn about all things going down in the fight world, you've come to the right place. Each episode, your host, Parker Keen, will take a deeper dive into the always entertaining world of sanctioned fist fighting. Now here's your host, Parker Keen. All right, everybody, welcome back. Episode 77 of Parker's MMA Show. Parker, we have an absolute MMA legend on the show today. Mike Goldberg, he is the gold standard of MMA play-by-play. He made his UFC debut in 1997. He has commentated some of the biggest MMA fights in history in a multi-decade illustrious career in the booth. In addition to the UFC, Mike has done Bellator, he's done the NHL, he's done the NFL, the NBA, tons of other sports. Can't wait to talk to him. Mike, Goldie, I'm so starstruck, I don't even know what to call you, but <laughs> welcome to the show. Um, you, you just call me anytime because you're my new agent. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was beautiful. I would like Billy to represent me, Parker. Uh, we can make that happen. Guys, you can make half the commission. You guys work that out amongst yourselves. <laughs> Billy, thank you. That's very kind. I'm glad that we could make this happen. And uh, kind words, kind words. And man, 77. Wow. That's uh, 1997, which is what Joe Thornton wore this year. You know, my buddy Jumbo can't win a cup again because Montreal beat him. But I digress, and we move forward. It's a pleasure to be with you guys, Parker and Billy. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I, you know, we'll get to the hockey talk later, but I, I want to, you know, every time we have someone who we haven't had on the show before, no matter how long they've been in this game, we go back to the beginning. So you're a Cincinnati, Ohio guy. What was that like, and, and what was it like growing up there? You know, for me, it was all about sports, and it was all about hockey. Um I was born in Cincinnati, uh, lived in Detroit for about five years, and then basically raised in Cleveland, but I never lost those Cincinnati ties. So huge Reds fan, huge Bengals fan. Um, My dad basically watched Pete Rose at Crosley Field. My dad not only saw the Big O play when my dad was at the University of Cincinnati, but then when the Big O played for the Cincinnati Royals, my dad was working at Cincinnati Gardens. He was up, you know, on the scaffolds of the scoreboard, So Oscar Robertson was my father's favorite basketball player, but he was all about Pete. And my two greatest memories of Cincinnati sports would be the Big Red Machine. I was born in 64. So in 74, the Big Red Machine. And I was allowed to stay up with my dad. And, you know, I remember Marty Brenham and Joe Knoxall. And this one belongs to the Reds. And uh, I I got a little trivia question for you guys in in a moment, though, about the Reds. But here we are, game six, you know, Fisk, the whole bit. Game seven, they win the World Series, and I'm jumping up and down on the bed at 10 years old with my father. And may he rest in peace, but it's a moment I'll never forget. I will never forget that moment with my father, because I used to listen to Marty and Joe on the big 700 back in the day. Uh, So huge Reds fan. And then September 11th, 1985, on a 2-1 pitch from Eric Shaw for hit number 4192. Uh, the breaking of Ty Cobb's record, Pete Rose. I was working at Channel 5 in Cincinnati then. I was still in school at Miami of Ohio. And I got my dad into all the games, had to. And I get my dad a press pass. We go downstairs and my dad's just being himself. All of a sudden I go, any questions? And I hear this, what's next, Pete? And I'm like, oh shit. (laughs) And I look and my father asked the question. (laughs) Needless to say, Steve Fiziak, who was the sports director at the time, he's done the Royals forever, one of my heroes. Fiz was uh, not all that pleased with me, in which I told him I can't control my father, in which he told me, well, you shouldn't have brought him down. And then I told him, well, my dad's a bigger Reds fan than both of us combined, and we laugh about it now. Uh, But that's Cincinnati in a nutshell for me. And it was all about hockey. It was all about hockey. Started playing hockey at six years old. Uh, My mom faked my birth certificate because you had to be seven to start in Southfield, (laughs) Michigan. I was six. I didn't realize at first that you can't use figure skates and shin pads. That only lasted for about a half hour. We ran out. We got myself a pair of skates. And the rest, as they say, is history. I played my entire life. My brother played. Uh, My son played at a very high level. Now my son and I play men's league together. And we're big Bobby Clark fans. And again, do the math. I was born in 64. We were orange and black. We were Flyers colors. 
You go 10 years later, you have the Broad Street Bullies. So you had the Big Red Machine and the Broad Street Bullies. So you had Pete Rose and the Big Red Machine. Then you have Bobby Clark. I was number 16. I do think I asked my mom one time, doing a book report, Mom, how do I get diabetes? She said, what? Mom, how do I want to be diabetic? What are you talking about, son? Bobby Clark has diabetes. Well, now I know why she didn't really like encourage it at the time. Um, but those are my greatest memories growing up. But I, I have one for you guys as sports fans. Who was the radio voice of the Cincinnati Reds before Marty Brenneman? <sighs> That's gonna be all Billy. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, I knew Park was. I knew Park was going to look to me. I'm. I'm the bigger baseball <laughs> fan of the duo. I would say, but I have no. I, I have no idea, Mike. I couldn't even hope to guess. This one is. You guys are going to love it, though. How about Al Michaels? Wow! Wow! wow. I only know that because they made these highlight albums back in the day, and the Reds went to the NLCS in one. It was either seventy or seventy-two, but we had the album. And it was Al Michaels. And then they had the big albums of the highlights and all that. And Marty, you know, and Pete Rose and, you know, Davey Concepcion, Ken Griffey, Johnny Bench, the whole bit. Uh, but Al Michaels was actually the play-by-play announcer for the Cincinnati Reds before Marty went his uh, 42 or 43 years before recently retiring. This is, a- you know, of course, I love Skyline Chili. This is unbelievable, uh, Mike. So obviously you're you're a guy who grew up loving sports, right? Uh, obviously you, you've talked a lot about kind of admiring broadcasters and everything. When did you get serious about I I want to do this for a career? Was it sometime when you were at Miami of Ohio? Was it before that? Like walk me through kind of I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a sports broadcaster. I'm Mike Goldberg. So I was um, I was also a singer and a performer in high school. And we performed in these rock concerts for the American Cancer Society. And when I was in eighth grade, the old Jerry Lewis telethon would have these local acts. They'd have these breaks, Parker and Billy, and then the local act would go and perform. So we go down to Channel Late in Cleveland and we get a chance to perform in one of the, all right, now we're going to go to the local and don't forget, get on the phone and support, support, support. So I do my singing that night. I'm already very involved in sports and playing hockey and and all of that. And I get to watch them do the news that night at Channel 8. And Vince Cellini was actually the sports director at the time at Channel 8. And Vince, of course, was at CNN for a long, long time. And I just stood there behind those cameras, you guys. And I, you know, I saw the teleprompter thing and I went, that's what I'm going to do. If I don't make it to the NHL, which I, I kind of knew, I got to play some D1, but I, I kind of knew that I was going to end up talking about it, not playing it. But I, I honestly, I knew in, in eighth grade by the performer meeting the athlete and meeting in the middle, but watching them do that that night, I was really fortunate. Because I've always said, Parker and Billy, there are a ton of talented men and women, kids, college kids in the world who just, they don't know what they want to do yet. And that's okay. I was really blessed that I did know what I wanted to do. So on freshman orientation, going into Miami of Ohio, my mom and I stopped by the radio station, WMUB, and I applied for a job for $1.99 an hour. I was a board op for WMUB, 88.5, Miami University Broadcasting. So I, I did know early on and I was able to go after it, which did help, which did help. So, Mike, talk a little bit about some of those early jobs you took, obviously, before you got the call to come out, you know, and get the gig with the UFC. I, I did some reading about, you know, you being involved with the Bulls in the early 90s. Just tell us some of your favorite memories from that time. Well, my, my first job was in Sarasota, Florida. And I keep this book of ding letters, you guys, and it's it's really thick, really thick. And back in my day because you guys have aged me, obviously. (laughs) Or actually, I've just aged. It's not really your fault when you think about it. Um, They used to just, they'd write in and be like, hey, Parker, dear Packer, you did not, dear Bobby. It's like, dear Mark. I'm like, you know what? Cost me like eight bucks to send you guys this tape. And I'm a very, very, very poor college kid. Like, guys, at least like write my name in. But my first job was in Sarasota, Florida. And I was really fortunate because... We had spring training down there. We had the White Sox in Sarasota. We had the Pirates. 
when Barry Bonds and Bobby Bonilla were the same size as Andy Van Slyke, which, as you guys know, changed over the years drastically. And we had the Rangers in Venice, and I got to cover the Buccaneers. Um, so I got a really good taste of it in Sarasota. Then I worked my way to Chicago, and that was huge for me to be able to go to Chicago, Sports Channel Chicago, in 1989. And that's when the Bulls all of a sudden were starting to, you know, Jerry Krause was starting to put the pieces together and getting Michael some help. So I lived through this Bad Boys series. I always say if you if you watch, and I think The Last Dance is one of the best sports documentaries that has ever been done, let alone the fact that I was blessed to live it. I truly, you guys, lived the first seven episodes. I was... At those press conferences, I was at those games. I was in those media scrums. I was talking to Michael, and the the different situations that I was able to live were just unbelievable and memories that will last for a lifetime. And I was there when you know Starks jammed over Michael, and I remember being in the locker room at Madison Square Garden the night after Michael went to Atlantic City, and he got a big hassle, and the Bulls were down, and. I never really bothered Mike when I was there because I, I respected him and I was there every day. And John Paxson and I used to have this, this little joke that we did, you guys. I, Because I, I'd always need to get a pregame interview. And I'd be like, Pax, can I get a pregame? Then he'd go, Mike, did you ask Michael? I go, oh, no, no, I was scared. Well, how about Scotty? Scotty said no. Pax would laugh and he'd go, well, what about Horace? And you know how Scotty and Horace were. Yeah. And I'd tell Pax, I'd go, well, Scotty told Horace to say no. <laughs> Pax go, well, go get Cartwright. And I'd be like, Pax, come on. Like, he's so tall. <laughs> and, then, and then Pax would give me the perfect interview. And he would go from there. Michael, Charles Barkley had been named the MVP that day as well. And Michael got back from Atlantic City. And I just waited. And I didn't even ask a question, you guys. I just put a microphone in there and said, what about tonight? I, like I said, it wasn't really. And Michael just gave me this, like, like interview of a lifetime. When I sent it back to Sports Channel Chicago, everybody was like, oh my God, Goldie, how did you? It, it, I believe it was his way of thanking me for respecting his bubble, for respecting the distance and not kind of being there every day in, in his face, if you will, and, and knowing that he was Michael Jordan and I would get my sound bites, but I would always keep my distance and understand that in the big picture, you, you can't get Michael Lady two times a year. You just, you, you got to pick your spots. And that time he picked my spot for me. And what that's one of the greatest memories I have. And watching them win titles, not only at the Chicago Stadium. I was there game six when Pax hit the shot against Charles and the boys. And I think Chuck and that team with KJ, they would have won with Thunder Dan. They would have won game seven uh, if it weren't for Pax burying that three. And then watching the last dance and living through all that, was uh, was unbelievable. It really was unbelievable. So being the sideline reporter for the Bulls um, and watching the greatness of Michael Jordan, not just on the court, but the way he handled himself off the court, I learned a lot just by sitting back and listening and watching other people and uh, the way that they presented themselves and the way that they acted on a daily basis. And to me, Michael Jordan will always be number one on and off the court because I got to live it every single day. And I saw nothing but first class. So as much as I'm enjoying this, Mike, I mean, we are 13 minutes into the podcast. We have not talked a lick of MMA yet. So I, I am going to turn the conversation that way. 1997, you get a call. You're going to Yokohama, Japan. This new underground sport. Little do you know, you're, you're about to debut on... One of the most legendary UFC cards of all time. I mean, we're talking Kazushi Sakuraba, Frank Shamrock, Randy Couture. I mean, just legends. What do you remember about your UFC debut? Well, I went to ESPN to do hockey and met Bruce Connor. And we lost Brucey way too young a couple of years ago. You guys being UFC fans, you heard me say it over 200 times. Tonight's show produced by Bruce Connor. And Brucey says to me, I was, I was actually, I'd left ESPN, I was doing the Red Wings. He goes, Goldie, 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 I got a gig for you. It's in Japan. They'll pay you whatever, and you got to take a jiu-jitsu class. And I was just like, cool, I got a gig, I'm going to Japan. He said, when you land, you look for the Shinkansen. It's the bullet train. You take that from Narita to Shin Yokohama. Well, 
I got off the plane, long flight. They flew me up front, so that was pretty cool. And I don't know if you guys, we probably realized there's not a lot of English on those big boards there. They like bullet train. I'm like, hmm, okay. So anyway, so I find the place. I get off. I roll my big bag in, which was bigger than the room that I had. And the first person I met was Elaine McCarthy, Big John's wife. Elaine was the director of operations for SEG back then for the UFC. And I really, like you like you kind of said, Billy and Parker, I, I didn't know what I was getting into. It was just a chance I was going to work with Brucey. I was going to Japan. I heard Rapungi was cool, and they were going to fight in their underwear in a cage. So here, that's, this should be awesome. Um, I knew one of the big stories was Frank Shamrock's debut, obviously, coming out of the shadows of Ken Shamrock, the world's most dangerous man. Elaine told me straight up, she told me about Elio Gracie, and she told me R is H in Portuguese. It's not <laughs> Renzo, it's not Royce, it's Enzo, it's Hoyce, it's Elio, and I moved forward. Then I met Big John and my partner, Jeff Blatnick at the time, the Olympic gold medalist, who we also lost way too young. And I'm just feeling my way around, and John lays down on his back, and I'm like, Okay. And he goes, get out of here. I'm like, yo, whoa, 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 whoa. Dude, you didn't buy me a drink. We didn't go to dinner. <laughs> I, I don't even know your name yet. If you want to smoke, but like, dude, what's up? So he showed me guard, half guard. Blatnik's laughing and he's huge, you know. And um, I'll never forget because John kind of put his arm around my chin and I was like, that was tapping right away. And every time Joe would say, and it was over a thousand times over the next 20 years, oh, it's not under the chin. It hurts, but he's not going to tap. I'm thinking to myself, oh, bullshit. I'm tapping. I'm tapping. <laughs> and so I, I just kind of took it all in. And, I, and John taught me a ton from day one. And Jeff took me under his wing. Uh, we spent a lot of time with Randy pre-fight. That was that wrestling community. And Randy and John were already tight. And that was my first one. And I thought, okay, Kevin Jackson, Michigan State, Olympic gold medalist. I don't know who this Frank Shamrock guy is, but he doesn't have a chance. Well, 18 seconds later, there was the arm bar. I didn't even know Sakuraba was as big a name, if not the biggest name on the card at the time. And then Maurice Smith, this badass kickboxer, gets beat by the natural, Randy Couture. And he becomes the heavyweight champion and we went on from there. It, it really was a legendary experience. And my 100th UFC, do the math with the Spike shows, was UFC 91, and it was Randy and Brock. And so for me to have my first UFC be Randy winning the title, and then my 100th to be Randy fighting Brock at UFC 91 was pretty cool. So my my bond with the natural Randy Couture, Captain America, as I called him, I'm the one who came up with it. Joe said the hero thing. I said Captain America um, is one that will last forever. But I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, it was human cockfighting back then. We weren't on satellite. It was two men will enter the octagon, only one will leave. Um, little did we know, as we're talking about right now, that it would blow up the way that it has over the past, you know, decade, uh, two decades and a half, really, 25 years since 1993. And Mike, I, I'd love to get another story out of you um, about something that I've read about. Can you tell the story of how you almost became the commentator for WWE Raw? You know, it's a, it's a perfect time to answer that because I'd like to congratulate my good buddy, Jimmy Smith. Hell yeah. yeah. We're big Jimmy Smith fans. Yeah, and you know what? And Jimmy really, you guys, he really welcomed me at Bellator because I didn't go and make the move to Bellator like, hey, here comes Mr. UFC. I went in and I knew a lot of the people there already from Spike. And then my producer, John Norton, at Bellator was with the UFC forever. In fact, we went back to ESPN. But it was Jimmy's show, and and I went in as, as a guest, as I was taught before. You enter the locker room, a new locker room, as a guest, and Jimmy Jimmy welcomed me and made me feel comfortable, and it was really easy to work with Jimmy because he is a lot like Joe on the air. And and I always would laugh and people would say, oh, Jimmy Smith, like a poor man's Joe Rogan. Okay, I would like to be a poor man's Joe Rogan. Because last time I checked, he's got a $100 million podcast. So if the three <laughs> of us were all poor Joe Rogans, we would all be loaded. We'd be rich. So it, that's okay. Um, 
so they say reach out for me billy and and i was I, I was honored by the offer by wwe because i was a big hulk fan i was a huge gene okerlund fan when i was in sarasota mean gene was living in sarasota and i would see him at this bar blueberry hill all the time his son was a hockey player played on the 84 us olympic team todd and but his back and forth with hulk was oh, i'll tell you what mean gene and so I was out, I was ready to go. They gave me a three-year offer. It was guaranteed. And it, it was a Monday before I was supposed to start. And we had a show at the Hard Rock. And Joe said all night, Golden, you're not going to go do porn. You're going to go do porn? I go, Joe, this is what they're offering me. I don't have any guarantees here, like long-term. I, I, I don't want to, but, you know, you're not going to go do porn. <laughs> I know. right now i think i am going to joe but okay well joe went up and he spoke to dana and lorenzo and basically he said afterwards he said man goldie's my partner he's my friend we love working together i don't want another joe schmo coming in um do whatever it takes and they called me about three days later billy and said you know dana did the math it was funny he goes all right you're gonna do 50 shows you know goldie it's not like with us, and that's what you're going to actually make per show. This is what you're going to get from us. We're going to bump you up to this per show. Then Lorenzo goes, yeah, and give him an extra 25 or whatever for a signing bonus. And I'm like, okay, you had me at hello. <laughs> you know? I mean, you had me at hello. And, uh, and so I didn't pull. And it ended up being um, the right decision. I didn't want to leave my family. And we were just at that point where we were about to make it in the UFC. And when you go through the Bay St. Louis, Mississippi's and the Lake Charles, Louisiana's together, you get pretty close to that family. And um, we knew we were in good shape. And so I ended up staying, but always will be honored by the fact that they reached out and truly great timing because I, I'm so happy for Jimmy because when he left Bellator, he went to UFC, did a great job. And then Obviously, the UFC started bringing in fighters like Felder and Bisbing, and Jimmy was kind of on the outside looking in. And I'm just really happy for my friend that he's found a great gig and he's going to be there and do a great job for a long time. Awesome. So, Mike, during your time with the UFC, in your opinion, what changed most about the sport in general? And then how did you change personally as a commentator over that period? Well, the thing that changed most about the sport were two things really. The first was embracing regulation. And Lorenzo Fertitta is truly why we are where we are today. Frank and Lorenzo, they had the money, they put it in. Dana was the voice and he obviously is now like a Vince McMahon personality. But Lorenzo went away from the station casino and went full time and he said, we're gonna be we're going to be legit. We're going to be mainstream. We're going to embrace regulation. And to do so, they hired Mark Ratner. That is the biggest key to the success of mixed martial arts as a sport. And obviously the UFC, you've got the longtime leader of the Nevada state athletic commission going to these other States, Billy and Parker and saying, Hey, this is okay. This is not what you think it used to be. There are rules. The unified rules were written. Big John wrote them. Jeff Blatnick, the Olympic gold medalist, is going to these states. And so we weren't renegade any longer. We were embracing the regulation and doing it right. And then Lorenzo said, we're going to be global, global domination. And we started to go worldwide. And the Ultimate Fighter season one was the turning point because people saw some odd personalities. Diego doing yoga in the rain, you know, was, was our, not one normal. of our favorites. <laughs> I know, I know, and one of Koscheck's favorites as well. But, <laughs> um, season, and then Stefan and Forrest, it it just it it gave the the people that weren't in the cult MMA fans a chance to get a taste of it, and then the contract was Spike in the free fights. How it changed me is right after nine eleven. Actually, I was I was ready to board a plane. We were there for some meetings in Vegas. And all of a sudden the tragedy happens and I ended up in Vegas for another five days, all of us in shock, obviously. And Dana 
just said to Bruce and I, because Brucey was with me, like, all right, we're going to take this to the next level. You guys should as well. And we went downstairs to the Zufa gym and I started training some boxing. Then I really got into Muay Thai, especially with Mark Delagrati, crew Mark at Sikyotong, and then Paul McGowan, uh, Master McGowan here. And that's how I believe that I got better, is I started to work on my boxing and my Muay Thai. And I realized that if you're hitting a pad or you're trying not to get hit, you better keep that hand up and you better bring the jab back to the chin or you're going to smoke to the side of the head. And that's when, you know, the stakes got higher and Dana said, you need to get better along with everybody else. And so basically, Brucey and I were down doing ring circles at the Zufa gym uh, right around, you know, right before Tito had that epic entrance, the first show after 9-11. And I just have continued to train and continued to try to learn the game and, and listen to Joe. And, and that's another thing that I learned as a broadcaster a long time ago. And Jim Nance is, is as good as anybody at it. And that's why Tony Romo has become so good so quickly because Jim Nance is the greatest quarterback in broadcast history, in my mind. You know, even though Tony's the quarterback and Phil Simms was the quarterback, I was the quarterback, but it's my job to get the ball to the star. And Joe was the star. And so my ego was in check. And not only did I get Joe the ball wherever I needed to get it to him, but I listened to what Joe was saying. And I watched what was happening, why Joe was saying it. And I talked to the fighters and I did the interviews and I, I'm a big homework freak. And the stakes got higher, the viewership got massive, and I put more time into it because it became my, my sole livelihood and something that I truly love to this day and uh, always will, always will. Awesome. Mike, is there a particular call from your UFC career or a particular fight or event, like something that really just sticks out to you now that you've had kind of some, a couple of years to, I guess, like reflect on that time in your life? You know, when they would play the Who video, um, Teenage Wasteland, that opening before all of our pay-per-views, and they would play it in-house. Um, Stefan and Forrest, I, I, I actually nailed. I mean, it would, have been, it would have been a big flop to miss it. I mean, they made it pretty easy, you know, that, to call the fight properly. Um, but, but that was one that I, I definitely... I was able to, to feel the moment in the turn and how epic that fight was with that six figure contract on the line. And I used to always say, you know, original ultimate fighter winner and Diego used to tease me back in the day, like, uh, you know, just uh, by the way, I fought and beat Kenny before they fought. So I'm actually the original ultimate fighter winner. Okay, I, you're right, but, and I remember looking at Frank Fertitta and going, two contracts, you, you give them both a contract. And they did. And Forrest and Stefan went on from there. Um, Vitor Belfort, Vanderlei Silva in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. I mean, the way that he swarmed Vanderlei, and it was like a Rocky scene, just pop, 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 pop. And that was the phenom at his best. That was one that I nailed. Um, Anderson's first fight against Chris Lieben is one I'll never forget. Welcome to the UFC. Welcome to the Octagon, Anderson Silva. And, and then the here we go and it's all over just kind of happened. I didn't say that at the very beginning. I it just I did it once or twice and people liked it. And then all of a sudden it became the the catchphrase. It, it became epic. And and we went on from there. Um I would say you know, there were certain fights where you do you want to be an ultimate fighter where people are bleeding all over each other. Marvin Eastman with a big gash on his head. Um, Edson Barboza spinning kick on Terry Adam. That was scary, scary, scary. I nailed the Oto Machida and Ryan Bader. And I, I got to give Joe Silva credit because he was talking about how Leoto co comes in and out in his karate style. And he goes, if you charge him at the wrong time, it's like the movie Fargo. It's like putting your partner into the, is that your partner in the wood chipper? And if you remember that call, Ryan moves in and Leoto gets him. I go, oh, he just walked right into the wood chipper. Uh, that was one of my better calls. That was one of my better calls. Uh, Rockhold Bisping was just, uh, was epic because it was 26, 27 fights in. And um, 
I, I, I knew that Holly, I knew that Holly was going to win the title in Melbourne, Australia. And, and that is to take nothing away from Rhonda. And to this day, Joe does not understand why I said, takes a lot of energy to be a rock star. Well, my point was, is that Rhonda was saying yes to everything at the time. She was doing movies, she was doing every interview. She was the face. Because Connor hadn't really come on and taken over yet. And if people look back at the history and the timeline, Robbie Lawler was supposed to be the main event in Melbourne, and Holly and Rhonda were supposed to fight three months later. They moved that up to save the card. And Rhonda, Joe even talked about it when she walked in, Rhonda was somewhat worn out. And the best line Holly said was, Rhonda's never been hit hard enough to know that she's in a fight. And once Holly hit her, Rhonda, instead of going hands up, chin down, she went hands down, chin up. And it was only a matter of time from there. Um, Joe, I still, ha I need to call Joe when we're done and explain the rock star thing. You know, I was talking about all the obligations and that she just wasn't able to just focus on the fight. Where Holly was like, Clubber Lang in the early days when Rocky was doing all the silliness. Holly was Clubber Lang just in the, arr, 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 and, you know, Mr. T won that one. Um, those were some of the best memories. Every Anderson fight to me was epic. That guy was amazing. And maybe the hardest fight for, other than leg breaks, which were nasty. The most difficult fight to call, the two that were most difficult, both involved Jose Aldo. One was Jose Aldo, Uriah Faber. It was the one pay-per-view in the WEC. Joe and I did it. We never said WEC. We said Aldo Faber the whole time. And Uriah was way too tough for his own good. And the other one was Hominick in Aldo. And the big hematoma three days before Mark was going to have a kid. Um, so those were two of the tougher ones to call, to watch our you know warriors in there take that type of damage and keep getting off the stool. When it would have been, it would have been just fine for them to say, "No moss," where it wasn't fine, of course, you know, in boxing. Is there any comparisons of you know you watching Jordan in his prime to watching Anderson in his prime when he went on that crazy run? A hundred percent, because nobody else in the world could do what Michael was doing, and nobody could stop him. So I, you know why, Parker? Nobody has ever asked me that before. And, and that is freaking awesome. That That's a great, great question. And yeah, there's a lot of similarities. First and foremost, they were the greatest in the world at what they were doing. Nobody could figure them out. So nobody could stop them. They were the matrix. They were magic. They could adjust it at a moment's notice. And Anderson would always do that early, kind of almost like a computer, like the, putting, the, putting the program together and waiting to see where somebody was coming, and then boom, 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 boom. Michael would do the same way. He'd D up, he'd go here, he'd go that. Am I going to go fade away jumper? Where am I going this time? Neither of them could be stopped. Both of them, class sex. Anderson Silva, one of my favorite human beings ever. Nothing but class. Same as I experienced with Michael. So, yeah, I, you know, I was wrong when I said that Travis Luter was the Michael Jordan of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> Joe got me on that one real quickly. That one I, Joe Silva in our pre-meetings on that one said, not everybody can be Michael Jordan. <laughs> Talking about Luter, and I thought he said that Luter was Michael Jordan, so I definitely messed that one up. My bad. And then I went Pippin, and that's when Joe said, I don't know any of this. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Parker. Yes, I would say Anderson Silva was the Michael Jordan, and Michael Jordan was a precursor to what Anderson Silva did his greatness inside the octagon because they were so much different than the others at the time and nobody could figure them out. So Mike, at, you know, after the UFC, after UFC 207, you moved to Bellator, right? Talk to me about what that experience was like for you and kind of w what it took for you to transition into that. Because uh, obviously it's still MMA, but at the end of the day, like, Bellator's putting on a, a pretty distinctly different product than what the UFC offers. So talk to me a little bit about that learning curve and what it was like working with Scott Coker and, you know, all the all the different things that come with working in Bellator. Well, you know, it's funny when when the rumors of the sale were going on, my mom, of all people, kept asking me, 
my, what's going to happen with the sale? And I was like, mom, you, you don't like, you don't fix something that's not broken. Joe and I have been together for a long time. Everybody's happy. Well, I was one of over 120 people that were let go when William Morris came in because their first interest payment was $170 million. A lot of people don't realize that because I was the guy on TV. Um, but I'm no better than the merchandise manager or the social media director who lost their jobs as well. Um, it, it was funny. It was before I was done at the UFC, we had um, a Uriah fight in Sacramento and I went to San Jose afterwards. I was at a Sharks game and Scott Coker's from San Jose and he was having a Christmas party for his Bellator people at the Sharks game. And my wife, she knew Scott and some of the other people. And she goes, Scott's here. She went up to some of the suite. I'm like, Scott, who? Like, Coker. I'm like, really? <laughs> so I meet Coker. Bless you. I meet Coker and I go, I he goes, we should talk. And I'm thinking, oh, hell yeah, we should talk. I need a job. <laughs> so Scott and I spoke. Scott, wonderful human being. Um, I thought talking, man, I'd start, you know, a week later. It took about six months. Um, but it was... Um, it was difficult waiting because I missed what I did because I love what I do. That was the biggest thing. Um, of course, uncertainty and family and, and all of those things that come with it. But what I really missed was the thrill of the sport that I loved and being able to do the thing that I told you guys I wanted to do from when I was in eighth grade on. That first show, though, with Bellator was their first and, at this point, only pay-per-view. It was at Madison Square Garden. The main event that I did on Spike was Ryan Bader and Phil Davis. Okay, I think I called the first one in Sweden. I was, I was in the building. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the producer, John Norton, as I mentioned earlier, Nordy was at Bellator. Format looked the same. Nordy's in there. Um, Spike, my days at Spike, four or five people are there from Spike that I worked with. Um, and it was Madison Square Garden. So it did not feel that different for me, that very first one, because of the magnitude of it in the Bellator. And I was next to another highly intelligent black belt in jiu-jitsu who had no hair in Jimmy Smith. So, you know, if everybody said he was like Joe, I was sitting next to Joe. Jimmy said, like, I wrote down Octagon and couple things like, don't say this. And Jimmy said afterwards, he goes, I go, did I call you Joe? He goes, yeah, a couple dozen times. I go, no, no. And he's like, it's fine, it's fine. So we we had laughs. When we first went to like our first casino show, Billy and Parker, then it went, was like, oh, okay. This is not where we were in the UFC before. But once the action started, it was the same. Shinzo Machida is in the cage, okay? Leoto's in the the fighter interviews with him. Douglas Lima is the champion at 170. I called Diego Lima's fights. AJ McKee's an up and comer. There comes his father. I called Antonio's fights. So what I found is that it's still the same fraternity. It's the same sport. And so when people say, oh, he fights UFC. No, 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 he doesn't fight Bellator. He doesn't fight. They are mixed martial artists and they're was the extended family that I was still able to enjoy and get to call fights with at Bellator. And the one thing that was really humbling, and, and I'll tell you one guy who really, really made, made my day and, and will always have a special place in my heart, is Michael Chandler. Because of course, Michael was a star at Bellator. He was the biggest star when I walked in. And when I first met Michael, he looked at me, and goes, Goldie, I'm finally going to get to hear it is all over at the end of one of my fights. And I went, wow, like that's what he thinks of me. And I, you know, I, I was bummed when uh, when he got finished by Bronx, But, you know, he's a great dude as well. But I keep in touch with Michael and I tell him often how special that was and how meaningful that was to me, because I had to remember that I was still bringing me to the same sport and that the UFC and Bellator are different in many ways. But at the end of the day, when the door, when that cage door locks, it's the same thing. And I was with a lot of the same people. 
And uh, that's when it didn't feel any different. Very cool. So, Mike, we talked to a lot of fighters about their kind of mental preparation and preparation in general. I wanted to ask you, what was kind of your preparation to get ready for a big card? Did you have any kind of fight day routines or rituals or just how did you get your mind ready for a huge card? I'd always want to hit pads with De La on fight day. And I'd always hope that he didn't stay out too late the night before because then he'd blow. Um, I'm a huge, huge prep guy. I, I, I learned that from Bill Clement during my days at ESPN. Uh, one of my broadcast idols and mentors, especially being a hockey guy, I, when I got to do the NHL with Billy C, it was like, wow, this is, you know, that was my Michael Jordan of broadcasting. And he said, Goldie, here's the deal. When you, when you feel like you've prepared enough, do another half hour of homework and then push it aside. Because at that point, you're just going to confuse yourself. So it's just going to become minutia. And so I'm a, I'm a prep freak. So I would finish. I would always read my articles on that last day and write in my final notes on like Saturday morning. And then I'd always want to go and hit pads and get a sweat and then listen to some good music and head over to the arena and get it going. And the thing that I knew is that I had prepared properly for the broadcast so I didn't have to try to fool anybody. Didn't mean I was going to be perfect. Didn't mean I wasn't going to not say prodigy or, you know, his precision is precise. I, you know, I, dumb things came out of my mouth. I know that. Uh, but it wasn't from lack of preparation. Um, but I, I was always fired up and there was always a, a buzz when I walked into that arena. But I will tell you, the Black Eyed Peas are my favorite band. I got to be good friends with Taboo of the Black Eyed Peas. Martial arts is in his blood. A lot of his dancing is based on it. That's how we became buddies. We actually became buddies through the Tap Out Boys. And um, for UFC 200, I'm, I'm sitting there at the hotel and I'm looking at T-Mobile Arena. You know, the card changed about eight times, as you know. <laughs> uh, and and I just was like, all right, what? I, and I just turned on Where Is the Love? And then I hit Tab. And then I hit Deja, who is Taboo's best friend, and, uh, you know, kind of went on tour with him. And I got to hang with those guys a little bit, which was a dream for me because they were my favorite band before I got to know them. And I just kind of took it in and went, man, I'm blessed, man. I'm blessed. Where's the love? The love is right there until they close the door. And then there's no love until that fight's over. And then there's respect afterwards. So that was kind of my game day routine. But we would always, before the pay-per-view, Joe and I, we'd always do the blow it up with everybody, right? And then you've seen Joe with his comedy before do that. Oh! You know, he gets cuckoo, right? So Joe and I would always, we blow it up and then we go, oh! and then we do it to each other on his forehead. And that was our way of getting ready. Well, Joe was all, he was always sweaty and greasy and like, <laughs> like where do I put my hand and wipe it off after that? And, but that was our thing. It was like, oh! and then Joe and I would do our thing at the top of the paper. That's awesome. We got two more quick ones for you, and then Billy has a little rapid fire. Is that cool? Absolutely. All right, brother. We appreciate the time. All right. So, um, Mike, what is your personal goals for the rest of the year? We're about halfway through the year. Employment. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Um, no, my, my personal goals for the rest of the year are – I've got some exciting things coming up. I am uh, going to be working with uh, BYB Extreme. I'm going to be calling their fights, and I'm pumped about it. The, the bare knuckle world is is blowing up, and Mike Vasquez, the owner, invited me to their last show, and so I will be debuting with them in July. I've got another group that I am doing a pilot with next week that I really can't talk too much about, but if that hits, that's going to be awesome as well. But I'm excited about, you know, their trigon and the fact that those fights are going to give me ample opportunity to say it's all over just like that. So I'm very thankful to the, the you know, Dada 5000 and the BYB Extreme team for, you know, showing the interest in me and bringing me aboard. So I'll be starting that in July and I've already voiced over some things and I'm very pumped up about it. So be doing some bare knuckle. Uh, I've got the pilot. And I also want to finally work on my motivational speaking and reach out and give back because so many people have given so much to me. Um, about a month ago, my wife and I went to a human communications like symposium. A friend of mine, Michael Burnoff, is he's 
he's amazing. He's a, he's a Tony Robbins type guy. And I met him hockey player to hockey player. And I did the opening speech. And then I just brought up certain things during this three day symposium, which probably lasted 50 hours over three days. And I just saw the reaction, Parker and Billy, of people. And I, I feel like I'm a humble person and I don't feel like I've ever been any better than the janitor. That's how I was raised. That's the hockey player in me. But I do know that my voice makes a difference to others. And so that is one of my big goals for the rest of this year is to put it into action because I tangibly saw what I was able to do in helping people by showing them that I'm human, I have faults, I've messed up, I, I fucked myself out of the NFL opportunity, it was my fault, it was my fault. Um, I had a bad game, I would have gotten another chance and then I got angry on social media and it's on me. And it was a really tough lesson to learn because it took me a long time, NFL Europe and everything to get to it. But when you say that to people and you admit that you made a mistake, they all of a sudden go, wow, okay, that Mike Goldberg dude, he just said that he's human. So I guess it's okay. So that really is one of my biggest goals the rest of the year is to, to help other people move forward and, and to know that they're worthy of their dreams and that they can come true as well. That's awesome to hear, Mike. Mike, does it, does the bare knuckle events kind of give you flashbacks to the early days of the UFC? A little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Oh, man, you're on fire. Parker, <laughs> you are on fire. <laughs> so, so I'm with, I, I did an interview with Benny Ricardo, and that's exactly what he asked me. Was, when I was, the, you know, a guest at the last show in Miami, no question about it. No question. Two men will enter the octagon. Only one will leave. Mm -hmm. There's no question. It does. And it's exciting. And the thing that I actually told Mike Vasquez, the owner, and, it, and it's really true, and you guys understand this, I'm sure, in life. Everybody thinks about the destination. And, oh, I just want to get to the destination. I just want to get this. I just want to be there. I just want that car. I want... Well, you know what? Like, we don't really sit back and enjoy the journey because we all have this level of insatiability. Myself, the huge level of insatiability. And when I look back at my 19 years at the UFC, the, the seminal moments were the first time we were at the Seminole Hard Rock. I remember when we went to Birmingham, Alabama, and I thought that was shit. Like, whoa, whoa, Birmingham, Alabama, wow! We don't have to eat it like, at um, Cheddar's or wherever it was, Cracker Barrel, Cracker Barrel, <laughs> Lake Charles, the only place we could eat. The journey was amazing. I told Mike that. I said, I'm looking forward to this journey because we're seeing you know, Paige Van Zandt did a great job at Bare Knuckle. We're seeing this sport start to catch fire and I'm excited about it. So yes, it does remind me of the early days and I hope to be just one cog in that wheel and, and one part of maybe 10 years from now, looking back and talking to guys like yourself and saying, man, you were able to do it twice, Goldie. You did it with the Octagon and then you did it with the Trigon. And I would love to be able to say that. So I'm on another journey and it's uh, definitely starting in a, in a rough fashion for sure. That's awesome. All right. Well, let me ask him one more and then we'll go rapid fire. So Mike, real quick, what is your best piece of advice to young broadcasters, you know, getting into sports or MMA in particular? Reps. Doesn't matter what the job, don't worry about the pay. Just do it. Do it. Do everything you can every single day. Love it. Get some thick skin and know that you're going to get a lot more no's early than you get yeses. Listen to those in which you admire and get some honest mentors. And that's one thing, you guys, that I have a, I have a kid, Weston DeWitt. He's not a kid anymore, but he was at the Cronkite School when I met him. And um, I said to him, I said, Weston, I will critique your work, but I will tell you straight up. I will tell you what I believe that I think that you can do better. What's good, what isn't good. I'm not just going to blow sunshine up your ass. Because if I do, I'm doing you a disservice. If I tell you you're great, this is great, and then you, you're not getting any jobs, you're going, well, Michael, like, no. Be able to take constructive criticism. I'm, I'm not mean about it. There's a, there's a nice way to tell somebody, hey, you could try this a little differently. So, but as many reps as possible. I did 
Oh my gosh, I was doing student radio. Ron Harper was actually at Miami when I was there for the same four years. I was interning at Channel 5 in Cincinnati. I was doing tapes all the time. Sarah saw that I literally would hold cameras for high school football, then put it on the tripod, shoot my own stand up for high school football that night, my first job out of school, making $5 an hour. Took a pay cut from my bartending job at Chi Chi's. So, young broadcasters, get some thick skin, make sure you love it. Find people who will be honest to you, kind, but honest, and don't worry about the money because you're not going to make a lot of money early on. You're just not. Your buddies who are accountants, like Miami of Ohio, all those business majors were like making like $20,000 and I was making eight coming out of school. And I'm like, whoa, that dude's loaded. Like, wow. Um, so don't get yourself caught up in it, but do everything everything and get the names right because somebody's parents are going to watch that swimming tape from when they were a senior in 1991 and you don't want to say it's the parker kane winner of the 100 meters <laughs> when his name is parker king because his parents are going to hate you forever and parker's probably not going to love you either we have a segment we do at the end of every interview with everyone who comes on here five rapid fire questions just like a five round fight we try and keep it not about MMA. So I got five questions for you here, Mike. They are all about hockey. So uh, five rapid-fire hockey questions with Mike Goldberg. Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. All right, the first question. If you are watching a hockey game as a fan, what is your go-to snack or concession? If I'm watching a hockey game as a fan, what is my go-to snack or concession? Could be in arena or at your house. Beer. <laughs> Great answer. Beer. Because there's not many go-tos because I don't want to miss the game. But I will always have a good hot dog at the stadium, though. Other Question number two. Other than Wayne Gretzky. Who is the greatest hockey player that you have ever seen? The greatest hockey player I have ever seen other than Wayne Gretzky. Okay, this is this is one that is very close to my heart. Is Joe Thornton. And it's for multiple reasons. One, he's over my shoulder. He's the nicest man in the world. He has been a mentor to my son since my son was 10 years old. And after Gretz, I would argue, Adam Oates is right up there as well, I would argue that Joe Thornton is the next best passer in the history of the game of hockey. So when I watch Jumbo move the puck and I watch him pass the puck and I see his vision on the ice, other than Gretz, I would say that it's Jumbo. I will tell you that I lived the Russian Five with the Red Wings in 1997. Sergei Fedorov in those white skates and to watch him motor through the neutral zone and do the things that he did, Sergei Fedorov is right up there with them as well. But I got to say Jumbo. Jumbo's my guy. Question number three. What is your favorite hockey sweater that you have ever owned? It's got to be my Jumbo jersey. It, it really is. It's Sharks. 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 My Sharks. Yeah, it's, it's Sharks. It's Sharks. Um, I was a, I was a Flyers fan early, so I would say my first, honestly, Billy, my first Bobby Clark jersey signed yeah. by Bobby Clark to Mike Bobby, your friend Bobby Clark, that was definitely boom. That was the one. That was the one. I, I liked the one at Miami of Ohio that had my name on the back too when I played college hockey, but the Sharks, the Sharks, and and the one I liked the most actually says to Cole. You look nice, Apple. You look like me out there. Joe, your friend Joe Thornton. Jumbo came to Silver Sticks. Cole was playing in San Jose. Cole has this little sauce, perfect pass. And Jumbo writes that on the jersey. I told Cole, I'm wearing that jersey. He said, Don't get it smudged. I said, I won't. So that would be my favorite one. So my Bobby Clark in the Jumbo Nice Apple one to my son. Question number four Where is your favorite place to watch a hockey game? My favorite place to watch a hockey game is the Shark Tank, without a doubt, without a doubt. And not only because the Sharks have become my team, but even before they were, my first ever NHL game was on ESPN and it was Anaheim at San Jose. And I experienced the Shark Tank. 
and the Shark Tank is special. Now, the place that's no longer there that will never be topped is the Madhouse on Madison, Chicago Stadium. And when Wayne Mesmer was still doing the national anthem there, walking upstairs in the sticky beer and the national anthem in Chicago, nothing better. So Chicago Stadium and then the Shark Tank. And I'll say Chicago Stadium because it's no longer, you know, there. Now it's the house that Michael built, the United Center. But it, the Shark Tank's pretty special. All right, final final question. Mike, who is your pick to win the 2021 Stanley Cup? Oh, man, I don't even care anymore. Jumbo got eliminated. Colorado. Colorado. Um, you know, I, I'm a Joe Sackett fan. And uh, I, I actually... I called the last goal ever scored against Patrick Waugh in 2003. Andrew Brunette in overtime. Uh, it was when the Wild came back from a 3-1 deficit twice. And Sackett, Forsberg, you know, Blake, they were, I mean, they were loaded. They were loaded. Milan Hayduk. Alex Tangay, Chris Drury. Oh, man. They were just, I mean, we weren't even supposed to be there. We were in our third year as a team. And all of a sudden, Jumbo, or all of a sudden, Bruno gets the puck from the late Sergei Joltz talk and it ends up being the last goal ever scored against Patrick Waugh. But I'll tell you what, I watched McKinnon put the, like put the wheels going on on that goal the other night. That dude is absolutely amazing. Obviously Barkley, good row got one last year. So maybe, you know, Jonas Donskoy, former shark can get a cup this year, but uh, yeah, the abs and I do not, I do love Mark Andre Fleury, but I do not like the rest of his team. And so Colorado needs to take care of this series right now and get rid of that team from where I used to do all those UFCs real quickly. <laughs> that's important to a Sharks fan as well. So I'll go Colorado. Well, that's all I have for you, Mike. This was an absolute pleasure. Uh, that was episode 77 of Parker's MMA show. Uh, Mike Goldberg. Paul Coffey. <laughs> If people have Carter, they're not really hockey fans, right? You guys, I mean, 77, Paul Coffey, come on, you know? So everybody like, rate, subscribe, share, you know, tell your friends. I mean, Mike, this was just a pleasure. Um, you're welcome back anytime on this show. So um, my name is Billy Naden. This is Mike Goldberg. He's Parker Keen. Parker, any parting words before we uh, sign off here? No, you're the man, Mike. You're a legend. We really appreciate your time tonight. Um, look forward to doing it again down the road. So uh, Anytime. You guys were very gracious in reaching out. And uh, this was a big part of what I talked about with the uh, human communications you know, thing that I took. And somebody said to me, you know, people are trying to do things they love like you've been able to do, Goldie. And so when you reached out, Parker, and said, Goldie, would you do the podcast? Like Michael Burnoff said to me, if if you don't do these things, then you're taking that opportunity away from somebody else to enjoy, you know, the bigger picture of life. And so I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did, because I truly did. And I thank you for reaching out. And the kind words mean a lot more than you guys can truly imagine. They really uh, do. We had, we had a great time, that. man. We grew yeah. up, you know, watching the sport with you at the at the forefront. So we really appreciate yeah. your time tonight. And we'll look forward to doing it down the road. All right. For sure. All right, brother. Thank you. Thanks, Best guys. of luck. You have a good one. All right. All right. Guys. We'll see you. Texas Trees is the premier tree care company in the DFW area. Whether you need basic maintenance or specialized services, when it comes to trees, we've got you covered. Pruning, chipping, bracing, and cabling, even root barriers and disease control, we do it all. And if you aren't sure what you need, we have certified arborists on staff to point you in the right direction. Visit us at NorthTexasTrees.net. That's NorthTexasTrees.net. Thanks for listening to Parker's MMA Show. Take a moment to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and visit Parker Keen's MMA Show.podbean.com for additional information on Parker and to stay up to date on the latest drama in the fight world. For more information and important links about today's episode, check out the show notes.